financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast. I'm Shane and... I'm Kyle. Certainly glad you've decided to join us today. The Vani Podcast is now covered by a Bipcot no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at Bipcot.org. The title of this episode is Anarchic Vani Part 1. And the show notes can be found at vonnypodcast.com forward slash two. Again, that's vonnypodcast.com forward slash two. In regards to that, we did finally get the website launched. And as most of you are probably aware, the first episode, Foundations of Vonnu, was released. If you haven't caught that yet, you definitely need to listen to that first. Or what we will discuss tonight uh, may be a little uh, confusing. And this is a series after all. So we laid out the calendar of future episodes. And we've got uh, the next eight or so months of releases planned out. Although it does look like it'll be March until we get to the action portion. We are both dying to get to that, but there's a lot of groundwork to be laid since we are attempting to breathe life back into Vanu. Again, the website is vanupodcast.com, and there's a lot of valuable material on there already. Obviously, Rayo's book, Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom, is available for free download, but there's other stuff there as well. For example, there's an FAQ with what we, what we believe to be the most common questions that could arise when someone is first introduced to this freedom strategy. Kyle is also gracious enough to put together a definitions list of terms that we'll use often. I've also congregated all of the articles we've been able to find on Rayo or Vanu in one place. There are some very interesting reads there, some I'm sure we'll get uh, more into in uh, later podcasts and such. And as you would expect, there are also About Us and con Contact Us tabs. Uh, if you got a question for the show, comment or whatever, uh, utilize that latter tab. Uh, we've also included our public PGP keys if you would rather communicate using encryption. That's uh, our preference anyways, right, Kyle? <laughs> yep, amen. So, Kyle, where are my manners? Uh, how the hell are you doing today? Not too bad. Not too bad yourself. Oh, yeah, I can't complain. Can't complain. Although I, I never really complain on podcasts because who cares anyways, right? <laughs> So, uh, Kyle, anything to add to uh, those housekeeping notes, or are you ready to rock and roll? Uh, I'll just take a moment and brag here about something. I just put up another uh, book report on my blog regarding how the War of uh, Independence, the Revolutionary War, the American one, was, was fought regarding, you know, the Saratoga and Philadelphia campaigns. Things more of a historical, or shall I say, historical revisionist uh, flavor of sorts. But, but otherwise, no, not really on housekeeping much. All right, good deal, good deal. So today we will be comparing and contrasting various anarchic schools of thoughts. I definitely think this is important, as Vanu has some similarities with a few, but vast differences with others. So let's get into it uh, by first defining our terms. Again, Vanu is about becoming as invulnerable to coercion as possible, and is, and is distinctly different from liberty and freedom, as we explained in the introductory podcast. So anarchy defined. Well, the etymology is pretty, pretty simple, you know, uh, A, without, or no, and then uh, Archie, rulers. Without rulers, no rulers, whatever whatever you prefer. It all means the same thing anyways. Uh, so this would be, you know, your, your black flag anarchism, uh, but it is the foundation for hyphenated anarchism uh, or the various anarchic schools of thought. Uh, so I guess enough, some of these uh, would be the, the one that I, I adhere to, the label that I choose, uh, voluntarism uh, or anarcho-capitalism. Uh, now, voluntarism, just, just simply explained, all interaction should be voluntary. Uh, it's essentially, you know, the golden rule only applied to the state uh, as well. And anarcho-capitalism, privatize everything. You know, two words can explain anarcho-capitalism uh, pretty, pretty, pretty uh, simply, right, Kyle? Yeah, I, I, I'd say so. A big thing being the respect for property rights and, and such. True, and, yeah. so, and so I guess you could say uh, being able to secure property rights without the state. Indeed, indeed. And uh, mutualism is also uh, another anarchist school of thought. Why don't you cover that one, Kyle? Uh, briefly put, mutualism would be an anarchic school that essentially says that uh, some people would also call it market socialism, which is kind of an odd way of putting it. The long and short of it is essentially this. Uh, kind of a, um, instead of like public property and the problems associated with that, there would be a communal property or, or otherwise uh, some kind of collective property in, in that sense among individuals who voluntarily consent to uh, those arrangements. And, it, and, most, and more, most particularly, it would be in the form of 
like cooperatives uh, of one kind or another for various different purposes, whether food production or other types of manufacturing and all that. It would all be like uh, cooperatives and such. Uh, even something like mutual banking, for instance, would be uh, uh, would be a type of cooperative. Financial services would in the form of a cooperative. Even the notion of mutual aid, which is basically uh, you know favor trading. You know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, and money does not have to enter into it. So that's the very abbreviated version of mutualism. Okay, very good, very good. And uh, you want to tackle uh, syndicalism too? Oh, what the hell, yeah. Syndicalism is uh, not quite as nice as mutualism in my not-so-humble opinion. Basically, this is the position that says that in order to uh, essentially get away from the state or whatever, the workers need to run the factory. So you can kind of already see there's a 19th century uh, flavor here. Uh, but basically, they call it worker self-management, where the workers have councils. Yeah, you can see it's already getting bureaucratic, even if they don't mean to. The workers have councils, and the workers decide how to run the damn factories, because we don't need bosses, as they kind of explain. Uh, and the main idea is radical trade unions. The radical part really only emphasizing that they're can't or shouldn't be any so-called union bosses. And then, of course, the union bosses in the real world do things like screw over their own memberships and, and then make deals with the government, right? The syndicalists are different in that they say there should be no union bosses and the workers need to control the means of production and so forth. Okay. Very good, very good. And anarcho-primitivism uh, or indigenine, which I think is the uh, the modern uh, the modern label that's used. Although it's kind of like voluntarism, anarcho-capitalism, kind of you know one one kind of means uh, the same thing, maybe just a different focus. But uh, but yeah, these are the folks that uh, you know they uh, they kind of disregard technology altogether, and so uh, they go out and you know live in the woods uh, as if it were uh, you know uh, uh, what hundreds and hundreds of years ago, Kyle. Yeah, something like that. Basically, uh, to put it uh, one way. The assumption is that because the state uh, uses uh, former free market technology as a way to oppress people and rob them of their liberty, therefore, as the indigenous would see it, essentially, if we uh, got away from technology therefore, and get back to Mother Gaia or nature or whatever the term is, uh, then therefore we have our liberty if we're living in the dirt, basically. And I, again, I mean, maybe that's slightly disparaging, but I don't know how else to put it, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good, very good. And uh, anar the anarcho transhumanists. So these guys are uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting bunch. Uh, so essentially, it's a you know a stateless society with humans merged with robots. Uh, is probably the best way to put that. And I actually uh, read their read their uh, manifesto, and uh, uh, it's kind of uh, you know contradictory, much like uh, much like syndicalism. But uh, yeah, I, I'll put a link to their manifesto in the show notes. But uh, yeah, they essentially beg the state for like you know. Uh, for like money for uh, research into the technologies that they want, uh, you know, to come into fruition. So, uh, so, so ponder that for a moment. A uh, an ideology that doesn't believe in in, in governments, uh, no rulers, uh, you know, no government, and uh, then they're going to beg that institution to uh, you know help them uh, help them uh, in their cause. Uh, seems like a little bit of a problem, right, Kyle? Yeah, as Stephen Kinsella would put it, I think they're dialogically stopped. So let's just keep going. Okay, uh, anarcho feminists. Uh, well, essentially, I think Kyle is probably the best way to pu uh, best way to put it. They view the state as the worst patriarch, and therefore abolish it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean that that is their view. Um, I mean, I've also heard, as just as a comparison, I've heard like the so-called men's rights activists or MRAs kind of describe the state as like the worst matriarch ever. But honestly, man. I just don't see the state as being uh, gendered or as being biased in favor of one gender over the other. It seems to basically, let me put it this way, the state really, as far as best as I can figure it, just uses men and women and pits them against each other. It balkanizes men and women against each other so that, they can so that it can rule over us all. So I think the anarcha feminists mean well, but I think they're off base by saying it's a patriarchy because, I mean, look at you know, uh, look at how the state victimizes men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely a, a good way to put it. And uh, uh, the next one, uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna cover all of these. Uh, there are obviously some fringe ones, but uh, yeah, we're not gonna concern concern ourselves with all of these. But uh, anarcho pacifism. Uh, so essentially. Uh, they want the state abolished, but uh, they see uh, they view self-defense as a violation of the non-aggression principle. They view you know self-defense as immoral, uh, which I have a major problem with, and I know you do too, Kyle. 
Yeah, again, to, to get back to argumentation ethics and such, I, I, I think they're dialogically stopped. Like, they're, they're, they're contradicting themselves without me even having to say anything. Yep, yep. Okay, and uh, agorism, which is something we'll, you know, it'll come up a lot uh, in future podcasts, uh, uh, and we'll get more into that even in this one. Uh, but yeah, agorism, uh, you know, was uh, founded by uh, Samuel Konkin, and uh, essentially trading in the black and gray markets, uh, starve the state and then smash it. Uh, so any anything it's it's also called counter economics, but uh, anything else to add there on agorism, Kyle? Um, I I would just say just more as a more as an observation that in many ways it does it is very it shares an assumption with with voluntarism regarding you know private property you know the propertarian view and so forth. But I would say it goes much it has it it goes in some sense it goes much farther, but. I would also say that it also has a different focus, right? The voluntarists basically are were were originally uh, and and should still be about you know strategic withdrawal, getting people out of the state and so forth. And agorism is more focused on uh, fighting the state in some way. So there is just I would say a different emphasis. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, and uh, national uh, national anarchism, which is something I uh, going, I'm going to read their manifesto here soon, so I'm not uh, an expert on this or, or anything like that. Uh, so, Kyle, I'll turn that over to you. Uh, just to not to spend too much time on this, I'll just say very much in transitory passing is that the main intellectual on this is a fellow by the name of Troy Southgate. What he was trying to do here was that he was trying to appeal to people that very much care about having homogenous uh, communities based on uh, superficial characteristics of one kind or another, uh, because there are people who do care about that kind of thing. Just this, this is a facet of the human experience. People do. Uh, there are individuals who do prefer to exercise their right of association voluntarily in such a manner where the, a lot of the physical characteristics of the people around them look very similar, whether that be skin color or or, or things along those lines. And that's just a reality that people just really kind of. Uh, need to come to terms with one way or another. So all Troy Southgate was saying was that of those people who want to voluntarily associate with others homogeneously in, in one sense or another, they should be able to do so without being subjected to the state, uh, forcing them to integrate with others. So, you know, kind of like that slogan that they have goes, for the community against the state. So, um, you know, they care about their folk, and they mean that very literally. And so uh, I'll just say that it's a... Uh, it challenges people's notions of the right of association, right? You know, Definitely, and, yeah. And, and I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due, but yeah, me personally, I don't care about that kind of thing. But then again, that's a market preference on my part. Other people, it's something very serious for them that they take as serious as a heart attack. And for them, uh, the national anarchist uh, uh, school of thought might be right for them. Definitely, definitely. And just one more question on them. Like, uh, I, again, I haven't read the manifesto, but like, are they for the free market or I guess what's, what's I guess their, their economic system that they want in place or, you know, unsystem if it's, uh, if it's uh, free market capitalism? They, I'm not entirely sure from what little I've been able to piece together. And maybe you'll, you'll get an answer on this, but from what I can piece together, they seem to either be neutral, kind of like how the black flag anarchists are on, on property issues or, they tend to veer more in the direction of mutualism. But again, mm. I'm not entirely certain. So it, when, you, when you go and, and study that and, and, and reveal your findings and such, I think you'll get a firm answer as far as that goes. But again, the emphasis is not on issues of economics and property rights. The issue is about that voluntary association does include uh, the right of, of individuals to voluntarily associate with people who look like themselves, uh, even if it is only superficially in terms of demographic characteristics and such. And really, all they're saying is that we are against forced integration. That's all the national anarchists are really saying, as far as I can tell. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so let's get into, you know, uh, the compatibility of uh, Volney with these uh, various anarchic schools of thought. And I think the first one we'll, we'll start with is uh, voluntarism or anarcho-capitalism. Uh, now, it is kind of interesting because uh, I, I don't know when, you know, the non-aggression principle was like first, you know, kind of uh, came into, came into uh, as, as like, uh, you know, something like crucial to, to an ideology. But, uh, but yeah, Rayo actually uh, mentioned something called the case for non-coercion, uh, which, which was his version of the non-aggression principle. Uh, you can find that chapter uh, in his book, Volney, the Search for Personal Freedom. We're not going to cover that much here. We're going to stick more to uh, Rayo's issues with anarcho-capitalism. Uh, now, I'd like to read a little bit uh, from his book. Uh, it's page 29, and uh, the chapter is Thoughts on Freedom Strategy, Utopias. 
Quote, this is partly in response to the ongoing debate between advocates of limited government and anarcho-capitalism. Both limited government libertarians, LG, and anarcho-capitalists, AC, believe in a duess machina, which will help keep their idealized open market capitalism pure. For LG, the duess machina is a constitutional, govern constitutional government which has powerful military police forces to discourage foreign and domestic aggressors, yet which somehow abstains from harassing the peaceful. For the AC, the Duess Machina consists of various protection agencies and insurance companies, which remain peacefully competitive and cooperative on the whole, rather than fighting each other, forcing people to do business, business with them, staking out territories, and becoming states. Both hypothetical systems are contrary to historical experience. Power corrupts sooner or later. State functionaries do what they can physically get away with, regardless of what is written into a constitution. A constitution can be amended, suspended, re re uh, reinterpreted, or simply ignored. And on the rare occasions when sovereignly independent military forces have occupied the same territory, the result was not competition and protection, but civil war terminating in one or more territorial states. Many AC seem to believe in word magic. If independent forces are called protection agencies and insurance companies, they will somehow abstain from doing the dastardly things which states will do. How insurance companies, for example, behave in that society as organizations subordinate to the state is not necessarily how they would develop if independent of the state. Uh, and let me see, I'll read uh, just uh, one more paragraph here and then we can, uh, we can discuss. But, uh, quote, achieving freedom and preserving freedom are really the same thing. States can be thought of as bad protection agencies or whatever. But most LG and AC try to separate the problem of achieving utopia from that of preserving utopia once achieved. Few LG are seriously running for legislatures other than for publicity or testing the constitutionality of laws. Even fewer AC are attempting to organize protection agencies capable of defying existing states. Instead, to achieve their utopias, both LG and AC invoke another higher order duess machina, a cultural revolution, a fundamental change in the world views, ethical values, political attitudes of most people. Certainly popular attitudes can and do change and can and do affect political systems. But LG and AC err in thinking of popular attitudes as something independent of and antecedent to a political economic system. A person's worldviews depend in large part on the opportunities and problems he perceives for himself. So long as he feels subject to the state and powerless to change it, he will rationalize that the state is really necessary, if not good, and will reject out of hand any arguments to the contrary. End quote. So, uh, so yeah, Rayo uh, had some concerns with uh, with anarcho capitalism, and maybe you know, Kyle, with with some of the, uh, uh, I was talking to somebody about this, but maybe you know, with with some of the, uh, and yeah, it is theoretical because th these uh, protection agencies still don't exist, uh, unless uh, possibly if you uh, if you consider like threat management center, but uh, they aren't, uh, you know. Their goal isn't, you know, uh, against the state. Their goal is, you know, uh, protecting person and property, which that's valiant effort, and they're doing a great job. But that's not the same thing as what, uh, you know, the the, the uh, theoreticians of anarcho-capitalism uh, say it is. Uh, so, so yeah, maybe some of these theoreticals that he's bringing up have been, you know, kind of quelled by uh, Austrian economists and, and and philosophers and things. But uh, uh, but yeah, still none of that's really come into fruition yet. And that was written back in uh, in the 60s or 70s. So, uh, I don't know, Kyle, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, if, if the voluntarists and, and ANCAPs were really serious in, in the sense of, like, long-range success in terms of abolishing the state, at least in some, some degree, yeah, the DROs, the Dispute Resolution Organization, should be a concrete reality, but, you know, much like uh, even, um, e you know, Cal Molinet was intellectually honest. Uh, actually, there was that uh, episode I think you did with him on LUA Radio. Mm -hmm. Where you know there was a question posed about hey where is you know where uh, you know is there a DRO I can sign up with because you know I you know I don't like government or whatever uh, where you know, I think that was the question and he answered like there aren't any mm -hmm. and the and it was interesting like in the old ANCAP literature uh, they meant they would mention about you know there's a personal defense agencies which would be more akin to the like what the minarchists would call uh, the executive branch of government the police and such and then there uh, would be the judicial branch and all that and 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 all of that kind of stuff the DRO the dispute resolution organization would arguably be more of like a, 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 a judicial function uh, adjudication arbitration things along those lines albeit a private sector a version of that, but as far as I'm aware, there isn't anything like that. You know, you mentioned uh, Detroit Management Center a moment ago. They're more like a PDA 
that's exec that's closer more to an executive function where they're just more concerned about you know life and death issues and you know and and use of force and things like that right um the uh, but as far as i'm aware of there's no dro type organizations in existence on this continent at all uh like again i mean shane if if you and let's say uh, another voluntarist have a dispute over something and you need an you demand again you can provide a market demand by yourself right individual customers and all that if if both of you want to try and find an adjudicator that both of you consent to you know him basically judging your case and then both of you agree ahead of time contractually to abide by his judgment uh, who do you go to honestly yeah you know there's also the old uh, ancient I, i'll mention this just in passing but there's the old ancient Celtic Irish notion of the and ex, and just excuse me if I mispronounce it but Bremen uh, essentially they were essentially a private sector type uh, jurist uh, respected often not always but often the elders of of their various communities the people would go to to resolve their disputes he would hear and there would be you know they would have their own type of due process and such you know they both both sides get to be heard and all that and then when the bremen basically is is finished you know hearing the case or whatever he hands down his judgment and they both obey and because they contractually agreed to and as far as i'm aware of uh the 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 amcaps have not done anything like that in fact actually i keep i keep hearing and seeing quite a bit of uh, the voluntarius shane the other ones uh, constantly mentioned about going to government court all the damn time to like sue the government or or ironically even for such things like copyright infringement on occasion so in terms of being consistent with one's principles and such you would think that the ancaps would move heaven and earth and it doesn't have to be the the celtic the ancient celtic irish bremen uh jurist system it could be something else as long as it's a private sector adjudication that's what a dro is supposed to do and they're not doing it that's the problem and i think that's what rayo was really pointing out is that there has to be ends means consistency here if you're demanding or i shouldn't say demanding but if you're insisting that people say what they you know mean you know, mean what you, you know, say what you mean mean what you say right and that means not just talking the talk but walking the walk and so in terms of walking the walk where the hell are the dro's i can't find one to save save my life and so when Rayo is talking about, notice also the implicit a shared assumption between the ANCAPs and, and even the minarchists, you know, constitutionalist American patriots in particular, regarding the, uh, the God out of the machine, the, the cultural revolution, so mm -hmm. called. That, I can absolutely testify to that. I mean, hell, I'm probably one of the only uh, few handful of people in the uh, content producers in the alternative media who actually move between both social circles of, of the anarchists and, and, the, and uh, the patriots. And it's noticeably different, but my God, I keep seeing, even in private conversations even, uh, you know, we need to, you know, wake people up, which is that, that's your oh, cultural yeah. revolution, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so there's that problem as well. I, I, I hope the listeners can kind of appreciate that you know, I, I I'd like to imagine that I wasn't born yesterday, that I've been around the block and I kind of know what I'm talking about. And so, yeah, Rayo was mentioning this in the '60s, okay. And and all I'm saying is, has anything really fundamentally changed in that sense regarding the specific topic? Yeah, yeah. So 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 two things. First off, I, I think m maybe maybe one reason why people adopt voluntarism rather than anarcho capitalism is you know voluntarism. The action involved with that is you know strategic withdrawal for the most part, and, and you know spreading the good word of voluntarism, voluntary interactions, and free markets. But uh, so I think that that might be that might be one thing. But yeah, you're you're exactly right. There's no uh, uh, there's no DROs or private uh, defense organizations or anything like that. Uh, but I, I think I think for the most part, and, and maybe. If 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 I if I'm if I'm wrong here, you can correct me. But I think obviously Rio critiqued uh, the, as I just read. You know the the idea of these uh, insurance companies and and DROs and things. But I think the I think probably from from kind of getting to understand Rio better. Uh, I think probably what turned him turned him off to the idea of American capitalism the most was you know the idea that it has it has to rely on a cultural revolution. It's not not something that he that yeah. it's not something that you can like pick up and uh, you know you 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 get up to you get up tomorrow and you just say okay. Free market anarchism. Here we are. Uh, it, it's not. It's not really something you can. It's not really like that at all. 
uh, which is why I, I think that's probably the main reason. Uh, you mean anarchy capitalist society and Capucine doesn't exist yet. Uh, and it probably won't in our lifetime. Uh, some people even think that it'll never happen. Uh, so I think that's probably his, uh, uh, probably his, his biggest critique. Yeah, I'd say so. And just, uh, just in the terms of, you know, equal opportunity criticism here before we, you know, get on to other things, I'll just, I'll just say this, like the Patriots are also equally culpable as well, right? Because they're supposed to be setting up, as I've mentioned for years, and I'll just mention it only here in passing, they're supposed to be setting up local committees of safety, which they, which, which is what the founders did, because without committees of safety, historically speaking, there would have been no America, period. So between committees of safety for the minarchists and the DROs for uh, the, the ANCAPs, you know, you would think there would be like a, like a parallel two-pronged race here to see, you know, if they, you know, like a little bit of free market competition, shall we say. You know, can the Patriots set up more committees of safety than the ANCAPs can set up DROs? And uh, depending on that, we can either have restored, quote-unquote, restored limited government, or we can abolish the state, right? But you would think it would be a little bit of, you know, hey, let, let's have people who care about freedom in any sense. Let's have them, you know, friendlyly uh, compete in some sense, and both of them can take on the state in that way. You would think people who are serious about freedom would be doing that, but actually, no, they're not. Because the similarity, and this is the capstone, this is what Rayo is getting at, the similarity is they're promoting this mythical, uh, almost virtually superstitious notion, ephemeral, ephemeral fluff, I think James Corbett once described it as, uh, that of this cultural revolution. And that, and that, that's what you know, we need to wake people up. I mean, this is just, this is silly language. It's silly. You cannot wake people up. There is no collective awakening at all. It doesn't exist. It's, it's a fantasy. Kind of like how the state is, you know, that great fiction, as Frederick Bastiat pointed out. The state is that great fiction by which everyone tries to live at the expense of everyone else. And he believed in limited government, uh, mm -hmm. being a Frenchman at that time and such. So, you know, if the state is a fiction, and uh, we also, you know, it's, let me put it this way. The state is not the only fiction around. Another fiction would be the Cultural Revolution, so-called, to try and encourage people to get away from the other fiction, that is the state. So, in other words, if you want freedom, you can't try and generate another fiction to fight another fiction, right? I mean, what do you think corporations are? Mm -hmm. That's just another fiction created by the state with limited liability protection, right? So the problem here is, just to kind of sum up, Rayo, I think, was pointing out that the cultural revolution is itself a fiction, and the reason why the minarchists and the ANCAPs both are not really accomplishing their goals of either approach, limited government or no government, is because they're both sharing the same assumption of promoting this fiction called a cultural revolution that, that doesn't go anywhere because you cannot wake up people collectively. There is no collective awakening. It doesn't exist. So this is why it's been such a failure for all these decades, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, very good points. Very good points. So uh, let's move forward to uh, primitivism and digenine. Obviously, you know, Rayo, uh, you know, moved out into the woods and, you know, uh, lived in a polyethylene tent at one time and, you know, wrote extensively and drew diagrams on it and, and all that fun stuff. Uh, so obviously, yeah, he kind of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, I guess you could say adopted, uh, his application of Ani was, was primit primitivist, but I'll, I'll say that loosely. But he was also in favor of technology. Uh, he talked about uh, secure communicators, 3D printers. Uh, he didn't use the term 3D printers, but he kind of explained uh, something similar to that, uh, et cetera. And I'd like to give you an insight into, you know, this was written in uh, July 1973. Uh, and this is his kind of idea of secure communicators. Quote, in the future, I expect more and more autom autom automatization of word and mouth communication and middlemen functions, greatly increasing speech and se uh, speed and security and reducing costs. The newer electron ele electronic technology integrated circuits is greatly reducing the time cost of coding and interpreting data. It is also increasing the ability of snoopers to snoop and correlate their findings, but not in proportion. For example, a relatively small cheap device can encipher data beyond the ability of any conceivable computer to break in a thousand years or even to identify as a cipher. And soon there will be inexpensive radio systems capable of relaying data in, in ways not traceable by 100 FCCs. And this is the, the important part here. And keep in mind that uh, Rayo was, uh, I, I think, uh, Benjamin Best in that uh, initial uh, art that uh, article we read in the introductory podcast. Uh, I think he mentioned that he was an engineer or something. So you, you can kind of get it like this kind of gives you even more insight into his mind. Quote, 
Here is how one such system might operate. To buy or sell something, I type or speak an inquiry, order or offer into my secure communicator. My SC enciphers my message and transmits it to SCs of a few individuals I know and trust, which in turn they automatically re-encipher and relay it in microseconds to SCs of people they trust, etc. In this way, my message can quickly reach the SCs of a very large number of people. Someone who is selling what I'm buying has keyed his SC to watch for messages concerning that product. When my message reaches it, it deciphers and notifies its owner. He and I then converse almost as easily as by telephone telefax, but without having any idea who or where the other person is. At this time, we may change our cipher so that our message is no longer intelligible to intermediate SCs which relay it. We come to terms and arrange delivery. If it's a physical product, delivery may be made through a drop, but most products will be information in one form or another and can be delivered through the SC net. An example might be a program for my automatic microshaper, which enables it to machine a replacement part for our home flour mill, or even parts for a newer, more capable automatic microshaper, or microshaper, end quote. And he goes on to kind of, you know, quell a concern, like if uh, someone bad, like a, like, so, say a bludgy, a police extortionist, somehow, you know, gotten, gotten one of those secure communicators through one of those trusted sources, uh, there's a weeding out process that he explains. But uh, for the point of this, for the purposes of this, I just want to, like, let you know that uh, he's definitely in favor of technology. And uh, the primitivists and the indigenine are not. <laughs> they definitely uh, are not. So uh, what do, uh, any thoughts there, Kyle? Well, just very briefly is that, you know, some people might accuse Rayo or just Venuans in general of being contradictory regarding, you know, the use of technology. No, I don't think so because, you know, it's one thing to, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to be a Luddite, but when you look at some types of activists, for, and I think probably the best example for what we're talking about here would be like the off-grid homesteaders. Can anybody really accuse the off-grid homesteaders? as being uh, primitivists. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of them use solar panels, and that requires batteries, but they, but in a lot of ways, they are very close to nature, about as, you know, maybe not to the degree that Henry Thoreau was at Walden, but, but a lot closer than a lot of us, you know, and, and unfortunately, this includes me too, at least for the present, uh, you know, in the cities, you know, being city rats and all that. So, you know, I don't know. When it comes to issues of technology versus nature, I think in some ways it's a false dichotomy or uh, it's more of a spectrum where you could say that people who are off-grid homesteaders are closer to nature but still using technology versus people uh, in a more urban area where the, 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 it swings the other way, where it's more technology and, and the only nature they see may be like at a park or something, right, with a couple of trees or something, right? <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, whether it's a false dichotomy or whether it's a spectrum, I think either of those explanations would, would be a little bit more accurate, at least in some sense. Because remember, too, issues of technology, I mean, that's all personal choice, isn't it? We're not talking about issues of right and wrong here, are we? Yeah. And, and yeah, and, and also, too, I mean, uh, Rayo chose, he, he made his, uh, he, he chose his market preference, and his market preference was to go move out in, in the woods and live in a polyethylene tent. But, uh, uh, and we'll obviously discuss this later on, too, but like vonuing in cities. Uh, there are a lot of ways you can vonu, and uh, some of those may include technology, some of them may not, depending upon uh, your application of vonu. Uh, he also mentioned in uh, his book that being able to avoid something requires some knowledge of it. Uh, you want to speak to that, Kyle? Sure. The idea here is that the one problem with the primitivists is that as time goes on, they would become more and more ignorant of the, uh, I guess you could call it the servile society, mainstream uh, culture, if you will, uh, as time goes on, right? And certain things are developed, or if not necessarily developed, definitely uh, noticeably change in a way that kind of alters how the game is being played in, in a sense. So being able to avoid something requires some knowledge of it. Yeah. Um, you know, those import-export activities, as, as Rayo would call it, uh, would expose the Venuans on, an, on a somewhat regular basis to what the Servile Society is, is doing at any particular time period. Um, so, yeah, so like, for example, if you think, let me just use one concrete example, like the, like the drones, right, Shane? I know the Patriot. That was, that was, yeah, that was exactly the one I was going to bring up. Yeah, go, go for it. It's all you. <laughs> so even, so even the Patriot movement is, is worried about like the drones and such, and they're right on this one. They are definitely right for being concerned, uh, because of the privacy issues and some other things. But yeah, like, like if you've got a bunch of the new ones who say, let's say they, let's say hypothetically they disappeared like, uh, like a gaggle of them in like the eighties or something. Um, or even the 90s, right? 
And if they've been in seclusion and not really doing a lot of import-export activity since, let's say, hypothetically the 90s, then by the time we roll around to now-ish uh, and the drones are our reality, they would be facing a very uncomfortable uh, element of the servile society they now have to deal with, but now they don't have any knowledge of it. So... Um, yeah, too. Oh, yeah, too. I meant primitivists. I'm sorry. I meant if a gaggle of primitivists went out into the woods, not the new ones. I'm sorry. Yeah, and to and to and to, uh, and to defeat your enemy, you have to know your enemy, and you got to know their tactics, and that's one that's one disadvantage to you know the primitivists and indigenous. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, imagine them like uh, I don't know. They they see a drone, like they're out there in the middle of the woods, and they see a drone. They're not going to know what the hell it is, what it does. Uh, they're going to be uh, very very uh, um, out outmatched, so to speak. Yes, and so yeah. Let me let me. I didn't mean to confuse anybody. Let me just correct what I was saying. The primitivists, if the prim primitivists, a gaggle of them disappeared, let's say, in the 80s or 90s, and then they just kind of came across a drone now, they would be pretty freaked out and not knowing what to do, as opposed to if there was a parallel group of Anuans who disappeared, let's say, hypothetically, at about the same time in the 80s and or 90s, uh, they would be, due to their import-export activities, they would then realize, oh, that's right, they're developing these drones, let's learn something about it and how the drones work so we can avoid it, right? Mm -hmm. So so that would be, pr that's kind of the distinction I'm draw trying to draw here. Yep, yep, and and you, you kind of mentioned this, but I'll, I'll, I'll lay it out uh, this way. Uh, but yeah, the, the adherence to primitivism generally don't associate with, you know, the state of the servile society. Uh, kind of what we were just mentioning, whereas uh, one application of Volney presented includes import-export. So, uh, so Rayo's application of Volney, yeah, import-export. Uh, obviously, I'm sure there could be some Von like some some Vonnyans who decided, you know, to withdraw completely, uh, and you know, not uh, not have any uh, uh, any association with uh, you know the state of survival society. But I, I I don't think that would be uh, be very wise, and I think Ray would probably discourage that. Yeah, probably. And and again, it's not even that they have that the Venuans have to have a lot of contact with the Serval society. It's just that again, the key difference with the with the indigenous or the primitivist is that they still have to retain or gain some knowledge about what the Serval society is doing. Especially if, say, in the example of the drones, uh, the Serval society develop, and especially the military industrial complex in particular, develops a technology that can then impinge upon their Venuans. Exactly. So that, yeah. 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 That, that's that's kind of the bottom line here. Okay. So the next one we didn't. Uh, uh, so crypto anarchy and libertarian transhumanism, or uh, anarcho transhumanism, rather. Uh, now we didn't didn't really define crypto anarchy, but uh, the best way to to put this is you know using technology to make the state obsolete uh, in some way. You think that'd be a good explanation of it? Yeah, that's accurate. Cool. Okay, so we'll, we'll move forward with that then, because the crypto anarchy aspect, uh, as I, I had a note here earlier today, and I think that's uh, it's pretty interesting. But uh, yeah, again, Rayo was in favor of technology uh, and privacy, and uh, he recognized it's a, he recognized uh, both of their importance uh, uh, in freedom, or as he would put it, you know, becoming as invulnerable invulnerable to coercion, you know, as, as humanly possible. Uh, now, in another chapter of his book, he mentioned something about underground banks operating with their own currency or credits. Now. I don't know, Kyle, but uh, I think he would be. Uh, uh, well, hopefully he's out there still kicking. He gives us a call sometime. But uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, I would think that uh, you know he'd be really in favor of cryptocurrencies and and, and the deep web and, and 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 all of those sorts of things. What, what do you think? Um, I, I think at the very least he would be willing to experiment with it, if if nothing else. I mean, technically, when he talked about underground banks, I mean the modern equivalent of that now would be the blockchain, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. It really, it. I mean, that is your underground bank, quote unquote. Is is the blockchain? You know, whether whether for good or for ill, that's what it is. Um, obviously, there are attempts by certain vested special interests to uh, try and sabotage the blockchain, which, of course, discussion for another time. But suffice it to say, for here, that yeah, the point is that Rail back in the '60s foresaw stuff like that, and the, and the reality of things like cryptocurrencies and in particular the blockchain is is rather uh impressive so you know it's uh, this is <laughs> i'll just say that that rayo was a pioneer and ahead of his time and this is just one more uh feather in the cap as it were that he was that he was such yeah and i don't know i'm thinking about this more and 
I don't. I, I obviously I think using cryptocurrencies. He he talked a lot about uh, you know gold and silver and you know alternative uh, investments to you know devalue like to uh, you know get it out of like the Federal Reserve notes and and, and the, the state is money and shit. But uh, but I don't know. Maybe maybe like the deep web and things. Maybe that would actually make someone more vulnerable to coercion, especially after Silk Road. Uh, with I mean I'm sure there's uh, you know some some sites some sites on there ran by governments. Uh, you know, trying to uh, you know, uh, to uh, entrap people, uh, and uh, as they're committing crimes. But I don't, I, I don't know. I that, that that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I think the problem with uh, the specific example of the Silk Road was that not very many people were practicing, you know, any sort of even minimal security culture. True. Uh, yeah. And 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 so it's you know, I mean, there's the technological question of actually making this stuff happen at all. And then there's more the privacy angle of it, which is where security culture comes in. And you really have to do both. There's not really a way to get around it because if you have a security culture, you know, whether in your own life, uh, regardless of whether you use the Internet in any capacity or not, if you have good security culture, you are essentially creating a second realm that is independent of the state or of a new, uh, if you will. And that's, that, that's just the bottom line. And so, yeah, there are people who try to practice crypto anarchy, but the problem is, and this is what we've noticed from real world activities, ladies and gentlemen, is that the crypto anarchists, uh, at least some of them, won't practice good security culture. And those are the ones that usually get in trouble with the state, uh, such as, you know, including but not limited to the Silk Road uh, experience, as it were. But yeah, I mean, if you combine crypto anarchy with security culture, you should be okay for the most part. Again, mm -hmm. to be clear, not a 100% guarantee, but in terms of lowering your risk, absolutely. Uh, but that would entail that you use encryption and just good security practices in general. You know, you vet and ostracize, uh, in, you know, your contacts as appropriate and so forth. A different discussion for another time, but security culture is, is the point here. Yes, yes. And uh, again, we're using some, uh, you know, uh, Venuum and uh, other terms like that. So just uh, Venuum is a place or situation of an invulnerability to coercion. I would recommend while you're listening to this podcast, at least until you get the hang of some of these terms, uh, go to uh, avanipodcast.com and pull up the definitions page and have those handy uh, as uh, you're listening so that uh, you can, uh, you know, understand uh, the, the, uh, the uh, grammatical variations and such. But uh, but yeah, we, we you kind of already mentioned encryption. But uh, uh, but yeah, he mentioned the secure. Uh, Rayo mentioned secure communicators, and uh, I think he would have definitely utilized uh, things such as PGP, uh, which uh, you can definitely uh, send us, uh, send Kyle and I an email through uh, PGP. Pretty good privacy. Uh, I think OTR and ZRTP. If he had to, you know what? Uh, I'm sure obviously his first choice would be be to communicate with with uh, individuals in person. But uh, obviously that's not always possible. So I think he would have uh, probably you know utilized uh, such things uh, as, as as encryption. Yeah, I think you really would have. And also keep in mind, too, that even even as recently as the 90s and a little bit into the 2000s, um, the technology definitely existed, but it wasn't user friendly. Now, it's pretty much safe to say that it largely is user friendly. You know, I've written my tutorials on PGP. Shane, I think you wrote the tutorial on Jitsi, which Correct, uses yeah. both OTR and ZRTP. So this is a reality. And so really... You know, those of us in the alternative media as content producers, and I would say particularly the bloggers in partic uh, specifically, yeah, one thing they can, they can definitely do is serve as kind of like, I don't know, a pro bono technical writers and basically try to explain in a very, using vernacular, you know, plain English manner, uh, how to go about installing in their, their readerships to go about installing and configuring a lot of this free and open source software that does use this digital encryption whether it's PGP for email, OTR for instant messaging, uh, or ZRTP for uh, VoIP calls, much like what we're doing now. Uh, I mean, th when, when Rayo wrote about secure communicators in, in, in the 60s and such, I think he was pretty much uh, envisioning things like those things I just listed, uh, which are thankfully now a reality today. Yeah, yeah, and another note on the secure communicators is, as I read, this was for like making sales and stuff. And I mean, it's, it's really, really neat. And it's, I think we're still kind of in the infancy, even though you know Bitcoin's been around since 2009, I think. But I, we're we're seeing things like Open Bazaar, which is like a marketplace, uh, a Bitcoin marketplace. Which uh, yeah, there's some, there's obviously some privacy issues with Bitcoin. But uh, I mean, uh, uh, th th obviously, this technology is always, always developing. Uh, like recently, uh, the deep web adopted Monero as uh, as a cryptocurrency on there. It's dark by default. So uh, I think for for those who are going to utilize, you know, 
uh, cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrencies, encryption, and exchange. Uh, I think a good thing to keep in mind is that you know technologies change, and yes, uh, I mean it may take a, the government a few years to catch up uh, with with the technology, but uh, there always has to be improvements and developments because yeah, the government's going to figure out, and you don't want to be uh, uh, that individual that uh, uh, you know is uh, <laughs> becomes vulnerable to coercion and gets tossed in a cage. Yeah, exactly. And so the idea behind using encryption, again, is to increase said invulnerability of coercion. That's that's the bottom line. Good deal. Okay. And uh, I think one note here. Uh, all throughout his book and in, in the uh, articles I've found written by, uh, by Rayo, transhumanism doesn't come up even once. Never really mentioned except uh, his his critique of you know uh, what we kind of mentioned with uh, if the primitivists went not, went out in the middle of the woods and you know didn't have any any association they would uh, you know be uh, outmatched uh, with uh, when it comes to technology. But uh, Kyle, when we were preparing for this, you mentioned something interesting about the nature and versus nurture uh, and kind of how it relates to transhumanism. Would would you speak to that? Sure. You know it's it's kind of interesting, right? So you've got people who would tend to focus on nature versus nurture questions with all sorts of things. And I think what's rather interesting is that Rayo very uniquely addressed it, but he didn't see it as being important. And I suspect that the reason he didn't consider it important was that he noticed back in his day and age, and I don't think anything has really changed since then, that there would be the self-appointed intelligentsia endlessly debating and debating and debating and not debating in a productive way like, for example, with a moderator and uh, mutually agreed upon rules where, where the listeners can you know, hear both sides of the story and then make up their own damn minds. But people just more bickering, let me put it that way, people just endlessly bickering uh, about this kind of thing. And there's like no results and then, you know, cult of personality and then it kind of devolves in there. And of course, maybe a little bit of political crusading and reformism on top of it, right? Uh, souffle and all that. So, you know, uh, Vanu being the answer, yeah, I, I think the reason why Rayo kind of leaned in that direction was people. I mean, some some people have some utopian dreams. Okay, they wanna they wanna they do they they're fearful of mortality. They have what some philosophers would call death denial. Uh, they want to merge with technology and become cyborgs, quite literally, because they they don't want to die. And, you know, the desire to live is certainly understandable. I've got that myself. I've got a very healthy survival instinct, by the way. But I also realize I'm mortal and that at the end, you know, my time will come. And I just, you know, and the big issue there for a lot of people, as well as myself, is, is you know, making peace with that in some sense. Uh, you know, not, not fatalism necessarily, but just being okay with it. And, and also not only that, but being grateful for whatever time you have left. Uh, the transhumanists really are rebelling against that. They're rebelling against human nature. They're rebelling, and I mean in a bad way, uh, let's just say delusional. Uh, they're just kind of all over the map, right? And so, as was mentioned earlier, when the transhumanists do things like they beg government, oh yeah, we're, we're anarchist transhumanists, but then in the same manifesto, oh, we're begging government to do research into cybernetics or something, or get they want government grants or mm -hmm. something like that, Shane. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, no, 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 and no. Look, the idea here, again, is, is to gain an invulnerability to coercion. And so some use of technology, which actually is beneficial to the individual, particularly, uh, I, I think is something that is indispensably, is an indispensable facet and can't really be ignored. Uh, and at the same time, you know, some degree of if not necessarily isolation or becoming a recluse, but let's just say geographic distance, which you don't get in a city too much, because obviously it's very dense, people are piled on top of each other to greater or lesser degrees. You know, you know the problem with such close proximity with people is that they, uh, there's a greater probability for coercion, right? Your neighbors could call the cops on you, even if you did nothing wrong, right? I'm sure many of the listeners are familiar with stuff like that. Uh, so if you have geographic distance plus you have technology on top of it, I don't see a contradiction there at all. Um, but unfortunately, people like to bicker uh, more often than not. And you know what else can I say? That is the servile society at its core. It's just bickering about all sorts of things and even bickering about market preferences, including like was mentioned earlier, like 
uh, oh, can we associate with people or should we not associate with people based on superficial characteristics and all this other garbage that has nothing to do with whether you are living freely or, you know, being in vulnerable coercion, which is what, frankly, I think a lot of political activists are honestly concerned about, but they don't think of it that way. They don't conceive it of it that way, which is why, in part, we're making this series such as it is. Yeah, yeah. And Ray would have definitely been against, uh, I guess the, uh, I guess the modern version of transhumanism with, with the, the manifesto I mentioned, simply because you don't beg the institution that's coercing you, like begging, begging, begging the institution that's coercing you, uh, for for your own ends or whatever, definitely makes you more vulnerable to coercion. So well, they also, well, yeah, hold on, one other thing too. People have a lot of Stockholm syndrome with the state. That is something, and and that's starting to get to the area of controlled schizophrenia, which we'll which we'll talk about another time. But, to, but just to mention in passing here, that Stockholm Syndrome with the state, you can't ignore that. And I think what Rayo was getting at is just quite simply that, <laughs> how do I say this nicely? Okay, on second thought, I won't say it nicely. People are brainwashed into basically enslaving themselves. And one way of doing that is, is focusing on counterproductive uh, discussions, bickering, where they try to get the answer, look for a false answer, if you will, regarding stuff like nature and nurture, when Rayo's observation, I think, was probably the closest to the truth, which was just quite simply that, oh, this is going to be fun, basically that the environment shapes uh, people, right? So if you look like, like a child in utero, well, yeah, the child has the nurture coming from his mother, but, you know, if, if like, the mom is, like, I don't know, getting beat up by, by somebody, you know, that doesn't have to be an abusive husband, for example, you know, that, that, that nurture, if you will, does affect nature, at least in some way, right, as the, as the child is developing in utero. And so, similarly, I think the status to serve all society works kind of similarly, right? People, you can tell people about more general concepts of liberty and freedom, but if all they've ever known is the public fool system, you know, so-called public education, government indoctrination, then telling them about just other things like free software or pick something, even off-grid homesteading, is so foreign yep. to them. Because if you think, again, function determines form, means determine ends. If the way that somebody grew up was incredibly authoritarian, then telling them uh, of a better way to, of arguably a better way to live that's that's bipolar opposite quite libertarian is uh, i mean you might as well be you know an extraterrestrial from like you know another planet at that point i mean the the the, the distinction is that bad because again function determines form means determine ends yeah yeah definitely it reminds me of and i'm, I'm rewatching parks and rec and it reminds me of the the uh, aziz ansari the indian guy when they went camping and he like you know bought everything from sky mall uh, like he couldn't just go on like a camping trip. He had to like have all of his amenities with him. And I think that's kind of evocative of uh, kind of you know mainstream individuals' reactions to uh, to some of these these foreign ideas, like you know off grid living. Okay, the next one, uh, mutualism. Okay, so obviously uh, Rayo discussed. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, getting getting with a group of like you know six eight people or, or something like that, creating creating networks uh, and cooperatives and things. You know, that's 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 fine. But uh, it doesn't have to be a close togetherness. It can be just uh, you know ex you know exchanging value for value. You know uh, if uh, uh, I know uh, I know Jim Bob over there, a colleague, and he uh, you know he needs his boat fixed. You know I'm really good at fix I'm I'm really good at fixing boats. And you know uh, uh, he's got a lot of uh, I don't know cigarettes. And you know I want cigarettes. So we you know we we, we kind of uh, help each other out. Uh, it doesn't have to be like you know a, a like a friend relationship uh, or, or anything like that. Would you think that's uh, that's accurate? Yeah, I, I think just as a working concept, yeah, I think that the way you've explained it is accurate, yeah. Okay, good deal, good deals. And I don't know, Kyle, mutualism kind of reminds me of a commune, and uh, that would certainly be, you know, anti-Vanu. Uh, it'd be hard to relocate, and uh, it'll definitely make the inhabitants more vulnerable, you know, if they're... If they're on this like a uh, oh, fifty or a hundred acre uh, commune, and so uh, you know obviously they're you know they're they're probably you know growing their own food and like trying to be self sufficient and all that, uh, but uh, it'd be really hard if they were to relocate, they'd lose all that they put into it, and uh, they'd probably struggle to uh, you know uh, survive after that. I don't know. Well, I know Rayo mentioned somewhere about uh, that when Venuans associate with each other, it doesn't have to be. I think the phrase he used was. Um, I'm just doing this off the top of my head, but uh, it doesn't have to be a close togetherness type of thing. I think were the words he used, or or something to that effect, and that's something to kind of keep uh, keep in mind too. 
um, you know, when you look at the other anarchic schools of thought, and the syndicalists kind of come to mind too, as well, just as a parallel, some of those other ones do require, you know, that close togetherness type of thing. And uh, because, well, remember, they're, they're collectivists too, at least many of them are. Uh, so, you know, that does, but again, you know, different strokes for different folks. Not everybody wants to be, you know, living on top of each other in, in metaphor, you know, literally or metaphorically, right? Uh, so that's, that's just something to kind of keep in mind. So I guess what kind of, kind of guess what we're getting at regarding mutualism, is it consistent with Vanu? <sighs> you know, to be perfectly fair, Shane, and maybe I'll disagree with you at least to some degree, maybe it could be in some circumstances if it's like in the, in the form of like mutual aid, like favor trading, or it's, uh, you know, without money or, uh, in the sense of, like a, like a cooperative, like like a food co-op would be the most easily understood uh, version of that. If that was the extent of it, then, you know, and it's like making bulk purchases, right, like, like from wholesalers and stuff. That could work, absolutely, I think, you know, and, and try to have like a, you know, even the, even the whole notion of a farmer's market in some sense, right? But aside from very specific, you know, techniques, I just honestly don't see how it could otherwise work in terms of like uh, like these worldwide free societies or whatever that, that Rayo is definitely not in favor of. You know, it's this is supposed to be about our Vanuums and Vanuas mini cultures, I think was what he was getting at. And yeah. I think that's just the bottom line there. So mutual aid, cooperatives, sure, I'll agree with the mutualists about that. Um, I, 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 I would th add this proviso though, you still need good security culture, right? You don't want to be trading or, or otherwise getting in bed with people, uh, whether metaphorically or literally, right? Um, with, with people who are just going to sell you out and, and just hand you over to the bludgies just because they get paid. Apparently, oh, as a side note, the, apparently the going rate for informants these days is now in the, what is it, three to four thousand dollars? Oh yeah, there and you can, and you can, and you can get, uh, oh yeah, you can get return. You can, you can get some, some good. Yeah, you can get some like continuing employment through that too. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Right, there's, there's that too. So you know, without getting too much, uh, too deeply into security culture issues and you know, cost benefit analysis of whether you know it's worth it for the informants to take the money and run or uh, and risk you know uh, ending up with a severe case of lead poisoning. Is, is just simply that, you know, if you do decide, if, if any Vanuans do decide to engage in some form of like work, uh, a cooperative of, of any kind, just be very, very careful about the people you're associating with. And, and for goodness sakes, please vet them. I mean, that's not asking a lot. And again, it's not 100%, you know, effective, but it will weed out a lot of people who otherwise would have gotten you in trouble. And that's just a reality of the world we live in. Indeed, indeed. And uh, I, I remember this and I actually went and, and found it, but uh, this is in the chapter. Uh, this is uh, Self-Seeking Green Revolution is the chapter, and this is on page 41 of the PDF. Maybe it'll be right around that. Uh, uh, actually, no, you guys will be looking at the PDF. I'm the only one with a copy of the book. So, <laughs> so yeah, page 41 of the PDF. Uh, quote, the total sharing community such as Robert Owen's New Harmony and other disastrous experiments with voluntary communism during the 19th century is discussed and gently but firmly rejected. There is, quote, the need for persons to individualize their interests rather than combine them. Persons who share goals can cooperate for certain specific purposes. This is voluntary association, and with it goes the right to disassociate. So I think that's really all that he really, I think that's all that he kind of mentioned, he was just, you know, kind of give, kind of writing a, a book review for the book uh, "Go Ahead and Live," which I'd you know, try to get a copy of. But, uh, uh, but anyways, uh, that's pretty much all he says about it, as as far as I understand it, Kyle. Yeah, one one more thing, I just want to kind of add on to this, just draw a finer distinction. I think the difference between a commune, which is a more of a syndicalist notion, versus uh, the mutualists with their cooperatives and so forth. Is that with the commune or, or the, or the worker, co worker cooperative, you know, where you're living in the factory, as it were, at least as best as I can understand it, is that it is a close togetherness type of thing where you are sharing a life like 24 hours, 24-7, uh, a life with these people. You know, whether for good or for ill, that's just what it is, right? It's, it's a very tight, almost in some ways militant in some ways that was that was the picture the mental picture that came up for me it reminded me of you know yeah. you know like uh you know like on a on like a i don't know some military submarine you're down there with like the same like 25 yeah, people for like right. a month at a, like for, for extended periods of time yeah right exactly and and that's that's more the syndicalist and the difference uh, between that at least that, or maybe i should say it's more of a shade of gray in some sense would be with the mutualist it's more of a cooperative where 
so let's say you leave your uh, you leave your Vanu shelter for the day and you go to another location, which is where uh, the cooperative is, and you do your business, you're transacting, uh, at least in some sense, and then you go back to your Vanu shelter, right? So there is a degree of removal, whether that be geographic or or in some other sense. And it's more focused on uh, econo on economic activity, right? Trading and, and exactly stuff, or yes. Whatever the function or whatever the function is, even if the cooperative was something like involving automobiles or or, or van dwelling and maybe repairing like a Vanuist uh, type auto repair cooperative type thing, right? Again, it doesn't have to be in somebody's home where you have like as you said, twenty, twenty five, thirty people living on top of each other. It could just be a common or uh, Okay, I'll go on a, on a limb here. It could be like a commonly owned or commonly used, but for Venuans only, uh, type of of Venuum, where uh, that's that's for a specific function. Again, a food co-op, automobile repair, you know, for your vans, right, and and such. Where you're basically, let me put it this way: you have your own infrastructure independent of the servile society. Mm -hmm. Maybe I think that's the distinction being drawn here, and if I'm understanding this correctly and interpreting it right, then yeah, that is something I personally would be absolutely in favor for. Definitely. We, we need to have a second realm. I'm sorry. There is no other way of getting around it. We need to have the nuums. We need to have our own stuff where we're not dependent on going into, say, a, a government-certified auto mechanic to basically get our emission safety inspection stickers and whatever the hell else, uh, you know, travel regulations from the bludgies. Yeah, we need our own stuff. Basically, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. So you mentioned it. I was. Uh, we're going to define this later on, but you mentioned it twice, and I want to make sure this gets this gets defined. Uh, can, can you like uh, I guess give provide a little uh, definition of set what the second realm is? Yeah, sure. And this is on the definitions page that uh, that I'll just momentarily pull up here uh, because it is important to define terms because that's what good philosophers and scientists do. But yeah, in, in many ways, it is very similar to a, a Venuum. So the second realm is essentially an updated version of the older anarchist uh, term, which is temporary autonomous zones, or TAZ. Essentially, the ability to conduct trade and other activities, including vices, in certain areas at particular times without uh, a threat of reprisal from the state. Uh, TAZ were originally conceived of as geographically mobile, much like Vanu shelters, Yet now it may also include cyberspace and in particular the deep web. So that's, that's kind of the second realm. And all I'm saying is that the, uh, if we were to have like cooperatives that were for specific functions like a food co-op, automobile repair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then cumulatively that would be kind of like um, a second realm of sorts where we have our own infrastructure separate mm -hmm. from and preferably invulnerable to the state. That's that's the kind of distinction I'm trying to draw here, and it wouldn't require us to live on top of each other like we're a bunch like we're in a hippie commune type situation. We could have our own still our own vanu shelters and live apart from each other uh, as we see fit and all that. But then we come together for certain specific limited functions, and then we go back to our shelters again. Yep, yep, that's yeah, very good, very good. Uh, so uh, this next one, I'm kind of I I've, I've wanted to discuss uh, you know agorism uh, in, in this uh, in the Vani podcast uh, ever since you know I, I kind of thought of uh, actually I'll preface it with this first. So so Rayo's idea of ethical enclaves actually predates that of uh, of agorism uh, by uh, you know again founded by uh, Samuel Konkin, but uh, they're extremely extremely similar. And uh, I mentioned, uh, if you've seen the promo video for the Vani podcast, if you're already listening, it's not really necessary. You're getting a lot more from, from this than a minute and a half uh, promo video. But uh, I mentioned in there that uh, it's very likely that, uh, uh, or it's, it's at least uh, very possible that, you know, Konkin drew inspiration from uh, Rayo when developing the the uh, the uh, actionable strategy known as agorism. Uh, now, uh, actually, I've, I've since, since, um, since, you know, making that, uh, Konkin did mention, mention Rayo and Vanu by name in at least a handful of articles that I've been able to locate. So it's uh, it's even more likely uh, than it was before that Konkin drew inspiration from him when he was formulating this idea. So uh, Rayo, uh, Rayo described uh, the black and gray markets uh, specifically. This is uh, the top of page 48. Let me actually I'll start I'll start on page 47 so you can hear his definition of an ethical enclave. I think that'd be the best place to start. You think, Kyle? Yes, absolutely. Definitions are always good. Okay, so uh, again, middle of page 47, quote, uh, the, the chapter is titled uh, Self-Seeking Ethical Enclave Black Markets. What is an ethical enclave? 
An ethical enclave is defined here as, as voluntary transactions between individuals who are living under a collectivist government when such transactions are con conducted independent of that government. Ethical denotes the distinguishing characteristic of participating individuals. An adherence to the ethical principle of voluntarism, the principle that no one should initiate violence or threat of violence against another. And there's a little connection to voluntarism there. Quote, and enclave denotes physical immersion within a philosophically alien society. An ethical enclave is not necessarily a separate geographical entity. An ethical enclave by existing, un existing within the territorial domain of a course of government is either legal, utilizing interstices and the taxes and regulations of that government, or illegal, operating despite threats of violence. Uh, so I'll skip forward uh, through this, this next paragraph. He's just uh, explaining an example of, you know, a, a black or your gray market trade. So, uh, quote, an ethical enclave may have similarities to a traditional black market, but the differences are significant. The mixed premise black market operator, while violating socialist laws, still holds at least subconsciously some of the premises embodied in the laws. He may experience a depressing sense of guilt. He may act with a handicap of psychological conflicts. The enclave entrepreneur, however, disavow disavows not only the particular instance of initiated violence, but the collectivist mor morality as well. He experiences an exhilarating sense of righteousness. He acts with the confidence and certitude of psychological consistency. The enclave entrepreneur, furthermore, is dealing not only with immoral, by their own definition, criminals, but with producers, with moral individuals who are committed on principle to hold confidences and honor contracts. His costs of doing business, therefore, tend to be less. Uh, I'll read this just ne this next uh, short couple sentences. Uh, an ethical enclave potentially embraces many more products than black markets, which deal only in illegal goods and services. In a nation where taxes and regulations are oppressive, a profit a profit potential exists for trading in legal goods and services, as well. Uh, so again, I mean, agorism trading in the black and gray markets, uh, and uh, you know, uh, ethical enclaves just seem you know more uh, expansive than, uh, than than that of agorism. But uh, uh, I don't know, Kyle. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, agorism is more of a closed system, whereas Vanu is an open system. Would you mind uh, uh, speaking to that? Yeah, sure. This the the notion of like an open or closed like ideological uh, ideology of one kind or another, even a strategy, as is the case with Vanu, is something that originally came up with the objectivists, and they had their own schism regarding whether objectivism was an open or closed system. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, if you have a, a, an ideology or strategy that is closed, what that usually means is that it's very strict, it's to the point, and it's not really, uh, well, shall we say, open to further development, right? It is a closed ideology or strategy is, it is complete. It really is complete. There is no adding to or quote unquote completing it because it's already done. It's been formulated from start to finish for what it's uh, supposed to do. Uh, it's there, right? Uh, obviously, by contrast, an open ideology or strategy is, is uh, able to be uh, further developed by other people coming along later who actually understand the foundation for that ideology or strategy, and they, they appreciate it, they take it upon themselves that this is something they want to either you know believe in or do. And but but they do think it needs like further refinement and all that. And then and those refinements, those add-ons, if you will, to further now if not necessarily complete it, but shall we say uh, making it more well-rounded, okay? They're adding to to make it more well-rounded. And that's that's kind of a feature with of something that's an open system, if you will. So Regarding the, uh, I guess you could say the relationship between agorism and Vanu, agorism is a quite, it's a closed system. And for what it is, it has to be. And personally, I think it's a good thing because it does insist on integrity by opposing hypocrisy, much like argumentation ethics does. Uh, and, and by focusing strictly on gray and black market trade, uh, as Konkin put it, those counter economics, if you will as in running counter to the state and so forth. The idea there is to focus people on, on fighting the state in, in that way. Uh, or as I think you said it earlier, starve the state and then smash it later, right? And, and it also adds a profit incentive too, which is, uh, Rayo explains uh, uh, in, in, in his book, that's, uh, I mean, some like uh, pro liberty for a profit, essentially. I mean, uh, so, so I think that's another, another good, at, like it, you, you're, you can act on your own rash, rational self-interest while promoting liberty uh, or promoting volume, whatever. Again, we've, we already defined those terms. And you can, you know, you can, uh, you, so yeah, you can, you can uh, spread liberty and you can, you know, benefit yourself. 
Right. So as black market entrepreneurs or gray market entrepreneurs, the agorists are pretty much singularly focused on that kind of stuff. And that's good because it gives them something very precise to deal with. And it's a, it's a very narrow road they're walking in terms of maintaining their integrity and all that. And there actually is a, a, I hope at some point it's an achievable goal in terms of abolishing the state, which is what they're trying to do. Um, I would say this though, Vanu, by contrast, at least in this sense, is a very open system. And I believe Rayo said some of the effect, correct me if I'm wrong, and especially if you can find the reference, but Rayo said some of the effect of, uh, you know, uh, Vanu is, is a spectrum. It's, it's uh, I don't know if he said the term shades of gray, but basically it, it, it's going, you know, you know, other people are going to have to come along later, or this is the impression I got, people are going to have to come along later and you know, appreciate what it is as a concept and how Rayo laid it out, but then further develop it beyond what he did, or at least that's that was my understanding when I read his book and such. And in many ways, that's what this podcast series is doing, is bringing all this to the forefront and then at the same time, in the spirit of Vanu as Rayo lay it out, further develop it. And that itself is very much evocative of an open system where the strategy, the ideology in question can be uh, held consistent, of course, with its foundation, but then further developed in, and, and preferably grown in, in a positive direction in order to accomplish its stated ends. Indeed, indeed. And, and, and to kind of add on to that, so agorism or ethical enclaves, uh, or, I mean, yeah, agorism uh, or ethical enclaves, whatever term you like, I mean, they're, they're pretty similar, except agorism, yeah, they're, they're two, uh, agorism is a closed system, and you know, uh, Vani was an open system, but either whatever term, agorism or ethical enclaves are simply an option for individuals looking to uh, integrate Vani into their own lives. So would you say that's accurate? Well, I'll, I'll just say this. The ethical enclaves, the, the, that Vanuan concept, would basically be approximately equivalent to what some would call the counter-economy, or better, uh, the agora, meaning the, the Greek for open marketplace, which was actually the root word Sam Konkin used to uh, kind of develop his close, his admittedly his close system of, of agorism. So I would say the ethical enclaves and the agora are pretty much synonyms at this point, right? Because we're still talking about, even though we're using different terms from different, two different ideologies and two different strategies, uh, libertarian ones, obviously, we're still in the real world describing the same types of uh, human activities, right? Gray market activity and, and even black market activity, even at times, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously, sometimes some of that gray market activity can slide into black market uh, because not because those entrepreneurs intentionally want to do so, although some of them do, but because the legalese, the government's use of lawfare, which is what my next book is all about, the government's use of lawfare can be so ambiguous at times. You know, it's not just loopholes, ladies and gentlemen. It's also something else called lacune. Uh, that term... Uh, basically meaning um, ambiguously vague laws that can kind of go either way, depending on, well, what the, pro what the government prosecutor feels like, feels like it should mean that day, right? Or even a judge or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of the thing. So what may, may be great today, maybe block tomorrow, or sometimes what, uh, you know, the, when the political crusaders do, well, they're political crusade, crusading, sometimes the black market activity can go all the way into what the agorists would call the white market, which is that legalized, uh, you know, pay your income taxes, social security taxes, and obey regulations and OSHA and all the rest of that stuff uh, type of activity. You know, so, I mean, sometimes, you know, certain types of human action can be moved from one type of market activity to another. So, uh, I guess uh, we've, we've pretty much, uh, you know, compared and contrasted uh, Vaughn with the, uh, with the anarchist, anarchic schools of thought pretty well, I would say. Do you have any, uh, any other closing thoughts on that? I would just say this, and you know, and this is something kind of to take away, and if there's any one thing for the listeners to kind of comprehend, it would basically be this. It's not that Vanu is necessarily anarchic. It's that what is anarchic can very well be Vanu. And I think the distinction is actually rather important because remember, go back to what Rayo said about the ANCAPs versus the minarchists. He didn't really see the distinction in some ways as being all important, that important, primarily because of their shared fallacy regarding the so-called cultural revolution, as was mentioned earlier, and so forth. So, you know, yeah, I mean, look, me personally, I would wish the anarchists to be uh, more invulnerable to coercion. And I would say the same thing for the limited government people, because the, fa because the fact of the matter is that the state is, is, is hurting all of us, because, at least in part, 
more too many people are vulnerable to coercion. And I think it's time to start getting practical about certain realities of life, such as they are today in early 21st century America. Yeah. Yeah, that's that that's very true. And yes, but in this broad in this in this podcast specifically, we are kind of you know discussing uh, anarchism and anarchic schools of thought. But uh, no matter what, uh, no matter what your political ideology is, uh, you can implement Vanu into your in, into your own life. I mean, you could uh, uh, you could be a limited government constitutionalist and you you know go out. Uh, uh, and do off-grid living. Uh, you could use cryptocurrency. You could you could use encryption. Uh, hell, you could even be. Uh, I guess actually, no. I, it'd be kind of it, it'd be kind of difficult for you know a socialist or a communist to reconcile. You know, going like with some of these things. We've already kind of talked about that. But uh, but yeah, whether whether you're a limited government, a, a libertarian, constitutionalist, a voluntarist, a gorist, whatever. I mean, uh, yeah, you can definitely uh, uh, begin to implement, implement Vanu in your life uh, today. The title of this episode is Anarchic Vanu Part 2, and these show notes can be found at vanupodcast.com forward slash three. Again, the website is vanupodcast.com, and there's a lot of valuable material on there already. Obviously, Rayo's book, Vanu, the Search for Personal Freedom, is available for free download, but there's other stuff as well. Uh, for example, there's an FAQ with what we believe to be the most common questions that could arise when someone is first introduced to this freedom strategy. Kyle was also gracious enough to put together a definitions list of terms that we'll use often, and I'd highly recommend you have that open uh, for every podcast, at least until you get used to the terminology. I've also congregated all of the articles we've been able to find on Rayo and Vanu uh, in one place. Definitely some interesting reads there. So today, we'll be comparing and contrasting the direct action between various anarchic schools of thought with Vanu. Let's get started. We've already done this a little bit, but there's going to be some some new stuff added in here. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we've got a list of you know uh, collectivist uh, direct action and individualist direct action. So uh, and we'll start. Uh, we want to end on a good note, so we're going to end with the individualist ones. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, collectivists, obviously, like your mutualism, syndicalism, syndicalism, which we've kind of already uh, hammered home pretty well, I would think. But there's a couple of new ones here that I think uh, we should we should probably address. Uh, and one of those uh, would be uh, affinity groups. So would you mind providing a uh, definition for that, Kyle, if you have one handy? Yeah, affinity groups are essentially like these amorphous uh, gatherings of, a, uh, of, of individuals who basically perform some sort of limited function. And again, the group is not, it's a little bit of a misnomer to even call it a, uh, an affinity group because it's not really a group group. It's really just more of a gaggle of people. Um, the closest uh, modern version of this would be like a freedom cell, actually. Uh, but again, it's more amorphous. It's in a lot of ways temporary, kind of kind of like a temporary autonomous zone, right? But just just for people to associate with each other for limited uh, for, for limited objectives and so forth. So that's that's basically it. Okay. It's just you and a bunch of buddies doing something to uh, for for limited range uh, of goals. Okay. Um, so I, I think partially that that could coincide with with Vanu. I mean, we discussed like the close togetherness, and obviously, I, I don't know actually because if you're going to get, like get in one of these groups with people. Uh, with with some individuals, uh, you're gonna want to be able to trust them. You know, you're gonna yeah. you're you're gonna have you're probably gonna be pretty close. Uh, so I don't know if this would. Um, I don't know. I I I don't know. I I would say I I would lean more towards no. But I guess in some in some circumstances, I mean, uh, he mentioned uh, you know uh, like the the small community on on the water. Uh, so I I don't know if that necessarily be like an affinity group. He also mentioned, uh, uh, or this is actually Benjamin Best. He mentioned uh, that, like, uh, it was the question of whether Rayo would consider whether Rayo and uh, uh, what was her name, Roberto, would consider having children, and uh, he said not with a group of two, but if if we had a group of four, uh, two couples, and I was like, okay, so I guess so maybe I guess maybe the idea of affinity groups could be applicable, but I I don't know. What do you think? Well, let me, let me make this just concrete for people. Um, if you if for anyone who ever watched that television series called The Walking Dead, you know it's been referred to that the that the main uh, cast of characters that, that at least have survived thus far referred to as the group with like a capital G um, that I mean that would be arguably an affinity group I mean it's not really a group group they don't they're, they're not like an official activist organization with like a name on it right um, it's it's more just a, a gaggle of folks who just have no, kind of known each other it's explaining a set of relationships is what an affinity group really is, and a freedom cell arguably works pretty pretty much the same way. Although I think the term freedom cell is a little bit more accurate. Um, hell, even in that one book report I did the other month on uh, James Wesley Rawls's you know Patriots novel of survival and the coming collapse, 
I mean, that follows, they did the same thing there too with the group with a capital G. The those that cast the main characters weathering out some sort of socioeconomic collapse or whatever they called the crunch. And the group, well, technically those people, those, those, those uh, limited government folks, because they were really insistent upon the Constitution, as, as you can imagine, uh, they too were a freedom cell. So, yeah, it is kind of this groupy, uh, in some ways it can be, doesn't have to be, but it can be a close togetherness type of thing. But it's like small numbers. I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Shane, but I think freedom cells are supposed to be what? Seven, like, eight, uh, se seven to ten. Like, it's, it's under ten people, for sure. <laughs> under right. ten people, for sure. Yeah. Right. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a close togetherness commune type situation. But, you know, don't surprise if it, if it goes that way, you know, either. Yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, and I'm thinking about The Walking Dead. I haven't watched that in a while, but uh, but yeah, I guess the, there were some members. Like there were obviously some, like a couple, few people in that group that were like really close, and the other ones they were just like, okay, like we're we're surviving. That's kind of our. That's like that they're here. We're 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 here to survive, uh, yeah, with, with without that close relationship. So I guess it is possible. And also keep in mind, sorry to interrupt, but also keep in mind too the amorphousness of the relationships. Because remember, because in that that fictional TV show, there were main characters that do occasionally die off. And so that kind of shifts dynamics depending on, on what their relationships were, whether stronger or, or weaker with the other people that they were uh, affinitated with, if you will. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, uh, so let's, let's go ahead and uh, move forward to, uh, well, I guess, the, so, so the answer for affinity groups, is it compatible with Vanu? Uh, possibly. I, I would say probably it depends upon the, it depends upon, it depends upon the affinity group or the freedom cell. Uh, would you say that's accurate? If there, if they, I, I would say the, the, uh, I don't, I hate to talk about lines in the sand, but if there were a line in the sand on this one, Shane, I would say it's security culture. Like is the freedom cell in question practicing good security culture? And if it is, then, uh, you know, then that gets you closer to an invulnerability to coercion. And if it's not, I would actually say it does the complete opposite. It would actually make you more vulnerable to coercion because remember the the police state informants and undercover agents and agent provocateurs and et cetera like to get to uh, tr raise trouble uh, and so uh, distrust between people who are uh, affiliated with each other as it were. So mm -hmm. actually it can go either way and I think what makes the difference is security culture. Very good, very good. So uh this one, uh, I, I haven't heard this term before, uh, and I'm sure some of the listeners haven't either, illegalism. Uh, would you mind uh, defining that? Yeah, illegalism is this old, um, really 19th century idea of basically committing crimes, even with victims, actual real crimes, uh, because that's what the state does. And so, well, you know, if there can be such a thing as public crime, then that, I guess that would mean, this would be the illegalist saying it, uh, that I guess that would mean private sector crime, you know, bank robberies even was what the illegalists were doing in France particularly. Uh, that, well, well then, uh, you know, that that's acceptable now, burglaries and such, right? So they were very nihilistic. That's kind of the bottom line. So if the state can, be, can do all this tyranny, then us as just private individuals should be able to do the same things the state does, right? In many ways, it reminds me of that one court case I wrote about uh, Justice Brandeis when he said that the government is the present omnipresent teacher, and um, you know it lead you know it teaches the citizens by its example. And what the illegalists do is that they take what Brandeis, at least in the spirit of what Brandeis said, quite literally, in terms of you know going and committing crimes, right? So if the, if, the, if the state, you know, for example, through the Federal Reserve System can commit counterfeiting, then why can't the illegalists also engage in counterfeiting in somebody's basement, right? That, that's kind of how they view it, right? Tit for tat and all of that. Uh, the problem with illegalism, as you can imagine, is that they are very blatantly and very pridefully and proudly, as they would say it, uh, violating property rights. Um, I mean, these would be the guys who would, for example, do the black block technique and uh, smash door windows. Uh, yeah, so when I interviewed Matt Pataglioli, we discussed the fact that, you know, most individuals live with, with two sets of morality. So uh, when they have interactions with individuals, I mean, uh, uh, most people would say that, you know, it's immoral to, you know, steal, rob, or kill them. Uh, but but when it comes to, when it comes to you know, the states, uh, the, the morality they kind of place on the states, uh, you know, the state can, you know, steal, uh, rob, and kill. Uh, and and that's that's apparently you know apparently moral. So that kind of ties in with uh, with illegalism here, uh, as far as 
I mean, I guess the illegalists are, you know, like they're they're trying to find a solution to a problem, and they're they're wrong. They're wrong as hell, uh, in in my opinion. But uh, uh, I guess they're they're kind of taking that to heart and saying, well, yep, two sets of morality, or yeah, two sets of morality. No, screw it. We'll do we'll do the, the same evil things the state does. Yeah, and so, and in other words, yeah, actually, to to get back to uh, some of Rayo's writings, there was that other essay. It's not in the Vanu book, but I think it's on the uh, the articles page on on VanuPodcast dot com. I believe it was called Libertarians and Coercivists. Mm-hmm. In that article, Rayo mentioned that uh, you know you've got you know there, he made the distinction between felons or real criminals, like with victims and such, people who privately uh, coerce others, and then you have uh, statists. So he would have the so he used the term coercivists to kind of describe basically everybody violating property rights, right? And then there's two types of coercivists. You have your felons or real criminals, and then you have your statists, uh, which is what libertarians usually deal with most of the time, right? So you have your private crimes and your public crimes. And all the illegalists were saying is that, well, because of statism, therefore we get to be uh, felons or real criminals, if you will. And so that kind of moralistic nihilism is, is kind of where they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. So so I guess, uh, is it compatible with Vanu? Uh, first off, I mean, Rayo did, uh, did discuss, I mean, uh, uh, voluntary interactions, voluntarism. He kind of explained the non-aggression principle and he talked about ethics and morality. Uh, so I would say uh, uh, no on, on, on that, like the moral and ethical uh, stance. Uh, but also, I mean, you consider like like these crimes, like bank robberies and stuff. I mean, that makes you more vulnerable to coercion. I mean, uh, if you get an armed standoff with the police, uh, you face going to uh, prison. I mean, that definitely makes you more vulnerable to coercion. Yeah. Anybody watch Reservoir Dogs? Like that infant, that now cult film by Quentin Tarantino is all about you know a bunch of criminals basically doing a bank robbery. That actually was a bo- or excuse me, not a bank robbery. It was a jewel heist, and it was a batched robbery too. So uh, the fact that it was so botched as much as it was, and oh, by the way, for people who uh, to, to, at the risk of spoiling the plot, there actually was an undercover cop as part of that, uh, that, that, that crew of, of jewel thieves and all that. And, and then that's in part why it, it got botched was because he, of course, uh, let, the, let uh, that's the cops know that they would be on that. So you see there are themes even in fiction where a lot of this kind of police state stuff kind of comes in one more time. But yeah, I mean – illegalism i don't think it's consistent with anything even even black flag or anarchism perfectly <laughs> yeah honest. yeah like it, it, it's it's basically it's ba- you know what it really is it's an excuse to uh to basically uh, give some sort of moral cover for private criminality that's what it is even if you don't believe in property rights even the most anti propertarian of anarchists still say you cannot harm another person's uh body They've always said that. Even the syndicalists say that. Uh, but the illegalists are saying, like, hey, even that's up for grabs. So, I yeah. mean, I mean, nihilism is a very dangerous thing when you start actually directly applying it. And the illegalists directly apply that moral nihilism to such an extent that, you know, they're, I mean, sorry, the enemy of my enemy is not always my friend. Sometimes they're just another enemy. And that's exactly what the Ill- illegalists are. They're just, they're just private criminals. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, so, let's see, insurrectionary anarchism. So, uh, I, I take it this would be, uh, I mean, you're at the attempted or even successful, you know, radical left uh, leftist overthrows of governments, like uh, maybe the Bolshevik Revolution. Would that be considered, you know, an example of this? Yeah, I'd say so. But also remember what happened to the Russian anarchists. They got betrayed by the Bolsheviks, uh, who, of course, you know, became the Communist Party there in Russia and and elsewhere. So. You know, it's. I think it would be fair to say that the insurrectionaries uh, or insurrectionists uh, would be revolutionaries. I think that is fair to say. But then again, not all revolutions are libertarian. In fact, True, most, yeah. most revolutions actually are very anti-libertarian. They're very authoritarian and so forth, right? Because by definition, a revolution is uh, generally speaking with very few exceptions. And I would like to mention one exception in a moment. Revolutions, generally speaking are just violent overthrows, not to abolish the state, but rather to just simply have a changing of the guard uh, through a use of force. Uh, so in other words, ousting the ruler from his throne in order to put another through, uh, put another ruler on that same throne, right? Uh, a lot of the violent conflicts between the monarchy and the various aristocratic families in medieval Europe and England in particular 
we're just we're just like mini revolutions or sometimes full scale revolutions in 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 that sense, right? Um, or on the random occasion when you would have a genuine people's war. I don't want to get too deeply in history, but I am drawing a distinction here. The whenever you would have a genuine people's war, or what I would like to think of as a real revolution, or or closer to one, uh, where people were basically seeking to overthrow a a despotic government, but then the problem was that those those people's wars or people's revolutions would usually get hijacked at some point to then not abolish the state, but in fact put in an, another ruler sometimes some sort of sycophant who was from the peasant class instead of instead of the patrician or, or aristocratic uh, families and such. But if there was any real revolution that was to really make a difference, it would have to be the goal is abolishing the state. And so if the insurrectionary anarchists were actually genuine, their revolution would have to be what could arguably be the final revolution, which of course would be abolishing the state through a uh, use of force, through violently overthrowing government, not to just replace one ruler or another, but rather to end government permanently uh, in much the same way as one would put down a, a, a sick dog or even a, a violently uh, aggressive dog. And that would be, kind of be the attitude there if they were sincere. Um, but in terms of like whether insurrectionary anarchism is consistent with Vanu, nope. uh, <laughs> no, not really, because remember, Vanu in many ways is about coexisting with the state, such as it is today and for the foreseeable future, but like still maintaining uh, an invulnerability to coercion. So in a lot of ways, Vanu is much more defen uh, defensive and all that. Um, what other yeah, and, and, and plus, uh, attempting to overthrow the government, uh, that's, uh, that, that exposes you to uh, uh, a lot of potential for coercion. So, uh, so that, and then Rayo also spoke of, I mean, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Uh, you know, rev revolutions. Uh, typically, I, I mean, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, actually, maybe in a hundred percent, uh, they lead to uh, the creation of new states. And 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 if if the people uh, are still living in that controlled schizophrenia, if they're still uh, uh going to if, if the if they're continue if they're raised in these government schools, uh, they're going to see a necessity for government. So even if you know, uh, one government was taken down, I mean, uh, the belief is still in an individual's mind. So uh, it's, it's not really going to do anything positive for uh, for Venuans. No, no, it's not. And actually, uh, just two things, at least quickly in passing. One is the notion about the propaganda of the deed, which essentially is this idea of doing certain acts, sometimes violent, sometimes not, where you gain a lot of attention. And now you have media attention. The media is looking at you and you're raising awareness about an issue and all this like political rhetoric. Uh, about raising awareness or whatever, and it just and it's and, and then that like itself is supposed to be like an ends and a means simultaneously when in fact it is neither. You know, propaganda of the deed has been done time and time and time and time and time again. And last time I checked, statism is still around. Like people still believe in government, the legitimacy mm -hmm. of government, despite all these propaganda of the deeds uh, throughout the 19th century and and at other times. So the insurrectionary anarchists do. Engage, do use the propaganda of the deed, but it doesn't do much, at least I don't think so. And the other thing I want to mention, at least quickly in passing here, is that what's interesting about agorism is that it's still revolutionary in the sense of, like, you know, uh, you know, abolishing the state through first, you know, starving it and then smashing it. The insurrectionary anarchists are solely focused on smashing the state, usually without starving it at all, which is largely problematic, right? Yeah. So the agorists, what's interesting about agorism is that it's still revolutionary in terms of like fighting against this, the state and going on the offensive, at least in at least in that sense. But it's different from the insurrectionary anarchists because the agorists are about as close to insurrection being insurrectionary without actually being technically insurrectionary, right? Uh, if we're talking, for example, about like gunning down law enforcement or the cops, bludgies, you know, the king's guards, as it were, uh, the blue coats, um, you know, the insurrectionary anarchists would be doing stuff like that uh, right out of the gate versus the agorists who would be trying to do other things like 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 avoiding the police or, or, or thereabouts and only if there's something like a raid or whatever, then would the Agoras try to, you know, match force with force or, or something to that effect. But the insurrectionary anarchists, I don't know, man, they seem to be m like borderline uh, martyrs, if you will, or want to be martyrs. Mm -hmm. They basically want to go and fall on their swords all day. So is it consistent with Vanu? I don't see it. It's not defensive at all. 
And, and in fact, and it, it, and unlike agorism, it doesn't even address how would you finance such a revolutionary effort. The insurrectionary yeah, wars, war, no answer to that. War, wars and revolution, wars and revolutions are expensive. You got to get guns. You got to get. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you're going to use explosives or anything, you got you got to have you got to have some money to, to actually like fund that. So yeah, that's don't a that's forget, a good point. Don't forget your underground railroads, your safe houses, your alternate identification for both operatives and VIPs. You're supposed to be protecting. I mean, revolutions are very very expensive. And remember. You know, if this was a genuine, like, people's war type thing to abolish the state, you know, we got to do this shit on the cheap. And quite frankly, that's not happening, right? I mean, we, I mean, normal people can't rely on central banking in order to fund their, to fund or, their wars. Right? Or, or taxation. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, it's got to be private, privately funded. Yeah. Right. And so, unless the insurrectionary anarchists were doing something like an assassination market, which actually is arguably cost effective, unless they're doing something like that, this stuff isn't going to be done cheaply at all, and it can't be. And it's not like they have these long trains of uh, long, uh, like trains of like logistical uh, supply lines, like the state does with its militaries that are backing them with like you know food and tents and like all of that kind of stuff. You need to actually make a war happen. Um, so they don't have any of this stuff. So is it consistent with the Vanu? No, no. It's not about invulnerability. It's not about being invulnerable to coercion as possible. It, they just don't do that. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have, we have a couple more, but they're very closely related to what we've uh, already discussed. So I'm just going to jump forward to the individualist uh, portion uh, of of this section. Uh, and the first one on there is uh, free love. And uh, uh, is it compatible with Vanu? I mean, uh, uh, Rayo had a, uh, a free mate, uh, so yeah, it's definitely uh, compatible with Vanu. Uh, one hundred percent. There's no reason it wouldn't be. You know what? Uh, the right of association and disassociation. Uh, disassociation and uh yeah you know choosing a, a lover a, a free mate whatever you want to call it i mean that's definitely compatible with vanu yeah i mean the original conception of free love was was it's true that it was happening right about the same time there was kind of the vague hippie notion of it but suffice it to say free love was originally a, a libertarian effort to basically rebut the assumptions that uh, marriage had to be essentially uh, monopoli be monopolized by the state through a license. So it's not even the marriage part of it that's necessarily the problem, because remember, marriages are a type of contract that pre-existed the state. And a lot of it was to, uh, was actually about property transfers without getting too historically specific. But it was about, you know, so about maintaining, you know, the, the stability of property and so forth and, and transferring title ownership and all that, whether it's lands or, or cattle, if we're going really far back and so forth. Uh, marriage has pre-existed the state. The main issue was about licensure and other things related to that, like uh, you can't perform certain sex acts, you can't do this. Basically, the criminalization of, at worst, what would be vices, like prostitution, for example. So... Yeah, free love was definitely a, a way to push back against all that and say, like, look, I mean, much like we can voluntarily associate with each other, well, one form of voluntary association is, quite frankly, romance. And to kind of ignore that or, or otherwise make these assumptions that, oh, well, of course we must get the marriage license and get permission from bureaucrats to basically do those types of things with our lovers that we were doing already beforehand you see the problem. Mm -hmm. And because romance, um, or, or even just, well, I want to keep this PG-13, but, but even sexuality, uh, does deal with issues of hearth and home. And that is very much, uh, and protecting that, making that as invulnerable to coercion as possible, you know, the stability of all, and remember, sex created the family too. So making sure that issues related to hearth and home uh, is very much a concern and, and, and a goal and a focus of Vanu, very much so. Definitely. So, yeah, when Rayo talked about uh, his free mate, he talked about, I think he talked about Dr. G, right? Uh, yeah, and, yeah in, the, in the book, and then the, the name came out by Benjamin Best, Roberta. Yeah. Right, yeah, his free mate. So, yeah, the, the notion about, you know, free love of and all that. Now, I know some people can get into the weeds and some people can do this, and maybe perhaps we should address this later, uh, but like monogamy versus polyamory, right? And, you know, at that point, as far as best as I can tell, that's all that's all personal choice type of stuff. Right. You know, just because hypothetically, just because I drink whiskey doesn't therefore mean you must drive a pickup truck. Right. 
This is mm -hmm. that's not issues of of ethics or, and morality of right and wrong and so forth. That's just individual market preferences. And regarding something like monogamy and and polyamory, that that I mean, let's be honest. I mean, that's just individual market preferences too, isn't it? Whether you have mm -hmm. one lover or or two lovers plus, right? Uh, the issue is is not really about that. The issue is should the state dictate to people whom uh, they're going to love, whether whether it's a chaste romance type situation or if indeed sexuality is involved at least to a, one extent or another, right? That's the issue, and that's what the original free love advocates were about, not about breaking up the family like many of these disgusting conservatives like to insist upon that free love broke up the family. Uh-uh, we were trying to preserve the family, numbnuts, not go to a bunch of bureaucrats and legitimize the state through marriage licenses. <laughs> Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. I think we, I think that pretty much covers that. What do you think? Yep. Okay, this next one, uh, di di do it yourself ethic. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, recommend all of you open up uh, uh that uh, copy of the PDF of 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 Rayo's book and just look at some of those diagrams in there, uh, especially re regarding the uh, polyurethane tent. Uh. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I think the di DIY ethic. I mean, he was figuring these things out as. As he was doing them, he was he was he found out some things failed, some things worked. Uh, he improved upon his uh, his uh, creations, his innovations, and uh, yeah, it was completely do it yourself. And hell, Vanu, like as as this cohesive strategy, uh, it was pretty much all do it yourself by by Rayo. So this one is certainly compatible uh, with Vanu. Without it, Vanu wouldn't even be a thing. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. And honestly, like I'm having a tough time finding any sort of quote unquote experts or gurus or self-appointed guardians of the status quo of various flavors, um, basically anywhere, uh, re re anything involving Vanu or even other related libertarian strategies like agorism or just other things. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, even, even libertarianism itself is basically one big DIY ethic type thing, right? It's, it's you know, you, or actually I should say more precisely, direct action actually that uh, like that Freeman Brill of direct action that you and I have put out mm -hmm. uh, like that is that is like pretty much I, I'm having a tough time seeing how it could be otherwise but I think it's either a hundred percent or pretty close to maybe like 90 some odd percent like DIY ethic type stuff right Where definitely you take upon your, your own personal responsibility to secure your own liberty and property rights and so forth through any of these you know methods we list in our directory and so forth and yeah Vanu is basically uh, very much part of that direct action where uh, you're not relying upon experts and just other people saying, well, we are authority and we have shown in our grand scientific pseudo studies funded by government, which is, they don't say that last part, funded by government that you should eat two eggs a day. And then, of course, they change their mind. Then you shouldn't eat eggs. And then five years later, they say you should eat eggs again. But then, oh, but then it's the egg whites, but then it's the yolk. And they keep flip-flopping all the damn time because, well, it's the winds of political expediency, ladies and gentlemen. They can't be consistent with anything. And so it's better to just, you know, be as rational as you can, follow your own conscience, and really take that DIY ethic uh, pretty seriously. Indeed, indeed. Uh, moving forward here, uh, jurisdictional arbitrage, which I think would be something similar to like, you know, country shopping. Is that uh, correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. Basically using, uh, the, the legal interstices or the law or the laws as they are today, not changing them with political crusading, but as they are today to basically make yourself as invulnerable to coercion as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, uh, that's definitely, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely Vanu. I mean, uh, a lot, of, I mean, uh, some folks, I mean, especially uh, uh, some of Rayo's suggestions or, you know, possibilities of making your money in one country and then living in another, uh, that would uh, definitely be, you know, making yourself more invulnerable to coercion. Uh, you know, living on the water or, you know, uh, um, having multiple, multiple places of residence or just, you know, outright moving from, uh, I don't know what, a, a really terrible, uh, a really tyrannical government to one that's you know uh, won't won't uh, uh, won't be as infringing. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's definitely Vanu, even if it's just like a a, a small decrease uh, in the uh, possibility of coercion. Yeah, that that's pretty much kind of the long and short of it. I think I think when we do get around to actually doing that podcast, getting into more detail about country shopping, we can definitely uh, explore more about jurisdictional arbitrage. I think Rayo had some things to say about it too, in terms of like 
leveraging, you know, being a resident versus being a tourist and getting into more nuts and bolts on that. But just here in transitory passing, yeah, it is it is a very individualist way of dealing things, right? It's like, what are the legal interstices for you if you're in, say, the Bahamas versus, let's say, hypothetically, uh, Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the laws in different nation states are differently. And if you're smart and you can figure out what the laws are, you can use it to your own advantage to make yourself, again, as invulnerable to coercion as possible. Indeed, indeed. So uh, you mentioned that you mentioned uh, temporary autonomous zones uh, when we were reading. Uh, there was a definition for I don't remember what it was off off off, off the oh it was second realm. Uh, second realm was was the definition uh, that they were reading. But uh, yeah, temporary autonomous zones and permanent uh, autonomous zones. Let's go ahead and define those terms uh, real quick, and then we'll uh, you know discuss whether they're uh, vani or not. Right. So the idea here is that. I guess you could basically say that when people gather together to engage in certain activities, they need to be able to do so in a way that doesn't have a lot of risk of being interfered with by the state or even put under even surveillance even, uh, the surveillance police state apparatus in particular, right? So the temporary autonomous zones are essentially mobile ones. So much like the affinity groups and freedom cells would be very amorphous, in, in their and how their relationships work, the the TAS are very similar in that it's it's very mobile, right? So uh, just because a bunch of people, for example, uh, got together and uh, performed some sort of activity of one kind or another uh, in a certain location, does not therefore mean that particular geographic location should always be used for that particular activity that they like engaging in. If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it may need to be done like five miles away next week or maybe uh, 200 miles away, you know, in, in a couple days or whatever, right? I mean, regardless of those specific details, the main idea behind a TAS is that uh, due to mobility, which I think Rayo mentioned uh, earlier on in, in the Vanu book. Yeah, yeah, cru yeah crucial, to him, crucial to him. Uh, mobility was crucial. Is that's, that's kind of the main idea with TAS. So, like, for example, if we get together tonight with, like, 50 people and we have a rave, uh, and let's just say uh, some people prefer to be more psychedelic than others, and I'll just leave it at that, then fine. Uh, but as long as, you know, the event was put on and there was a minimum, and presumably it was kept within good security culture was practiced, and there was a minimum amount of, of uh, outsider people who were not invited to the party, uh, and, and it's also the, the specific location, right? Obviously, you don't want to do it in a suburban area, right? Because, you know, some old fuddy-duddy might call the cops, right? And make you vulnerable to coercion, right? That, that's kind of the problem there. But if you were to, say, do it in an industrial park or, or some sort of abandoned garage or some other location where, you know, you could, you could pretty much pull it off, as long as your, your communications were good and you didn't, you know, invite anybody you shouldn't have, and, of course, preferably you would also have some people not necessarily engaging in the certain activities that evening but perhaps were themselves uh, performing the function of bouncers or, or otherwise on-site security personnel to make sure – that everything was pretty okay, then then you're good. And then, of course, when you do your next rave party or whatever, don't do it at the same spot you did it before, right? Because the state relies upon stuff like that. So, yeah. for example, a good example of what's not a TAS would be something like a nightclub, right? Because a nightclub has to be at a specific location, right? And they have to be licensed by the state and so forth with the business licenses and such and liquor licenses, right? Yep, yep, so, yep, yep. So the idea is that these these um, these zones, these these tasks specifically, have to be mobile. And then, yeah, even if they put on a one-time event, it wouldn't always be in the same place because again, the mobility is important as well as uh, secure communications and and some degree of vetting and you know bouncers even. So I mean, if you do it right and you know market cooperation works, you can put on you know and do all sorts of things that you would never get away with <laughs> in a nightclub. Which uh, is obviously uh, something I'm not going to repeat here because I want to keep this family friendly as much as possible. <laughs> but suffice it to say, I mean, you can get away with a lot if if there is good security involved. It'd be a very prof profitable venture as well. But uh, interesting example there. But yeah, you're, you're yeah you're you're right. Uh, you're definitely right. Mosh pits even in in some circumstances, right? But uh, but yeah, the the idea is that it's whether it's an event or it's some other specific function or whatever, as long as it's mobile, it's, well, as the T in Taz says, it's temporary, you, you can do quite a bit. And so by comparison, the, the, that PAS or permanent autonomous zone is just 
a, a more stable version of it. But again, that's getting into more what Rayo called like free ports and stuff more along those lines, which of course introduce other factors and are, I personally think are a lot harder to pull off. And I think Rayo even recognized that. Well, yeah, that was, that was, that's kind of why he, you know, uh, went off in his, uh, uh, in his, uh, camper, uh, on, on his pickup truck, uh, was initially because of those, uh, failed free Isles projects. It really never came to fruition. He said, screw it. I'm not waiting around. I'm going to take my, my life and my freedom into my own hands. And that's, uh, that was kind of the, the, the result was Vanu. Uh, now do they have potential, uh, nowadays? We'll definitely get into that in, uh, more podcasts and you're, you're, you're going to want to continue listening, uh, every, every single week. Uh, but, uh, I guess one other temporary, I guess, I guess it could be temporary or permanent, really, right? Uh, when it comes to like you know the, the Vanu shelters, I think you call them a uh, uh or or home base. I think you call them that too. But uh, I guess those would probably be uh, more t- more. T- well, actually, yeah, they definitely be temporary because uh, he he wrote in that book uh, that you know they had they they change locations every uh, you know whatever the whatever the frequency was. But they uh, you don't want to bring so much stuff into your home base that it'll be uh, really hard or take a long time to you know relocate. Uh, so I think uh, volumes, you know, the the home bases, the home shelters, uh, really uh, the, the place where you're most secure. I think those really would have to be temporary, don't you think? Well, at least in the way that Rayo is experimenting with, yeah. I mean, what he was essentially describing was the establishment and and of course the use of uh, the the Tazes, the temporary autonomous zones, like that polypropylene tent, wall tent type thing with the branches, and, the, and he mentioned like one time the snow fell on it or something. <laughs> um, you know that was a Taz. Uh, the foam hut thing that he was experimenting with too. That that was that was a, a a Taz, and so was the I think what was it the den I think he called it. You know that was a Taz too, and he and so those types of shelters or Vanu shelters. Of the ones he experimented with were were were, were Taz's. I mean, even before when he was a van, dwe- uh, well, he called it van nomadism, but now the modern term is van dweller. And there's all sorts of people up on YouTube who, if you type in van dweller, you can see people videos of people who say, "Yes, I'm living in my van full time." I mean, those guys. I mean, that those are all temporary autonomous zones too, with wherever they end up parking the van for that evening. I mean, that that's a Taz too, technically, because they're mobile. So, you know, that, that's kind of another version of it. The question, though, and this is, and in some sense, this is debatable and perhaps better for when, when we do the episode on van nomadism, is does actually having a Taz make you less or more vulnerable to coercion? Because there's also been some evidence coming out, at least in the sense of the van specifically, that you might be making yourself more vulnerable to coercion. But again, we'll, 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 we'll kind of table that for now for that later episode. But it's definitely something to consider. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess for for the uh, for the Tazes and Pazes, the temporary and permanent autonomous zones. Uh, for right now, I I, I I guess we'll kind of just leave it as uh, there's a lot more to get into. So, uh, are they are they Vanu? I mean, they uh, they probably could be Vanu, but there are a lot of factors that have to be taken into consideration. And uh, for the purposes of this podcast, it's not really applicable. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, and wrap this up, Kyle. What are your closing thoughts? My closing thoughts are that I think that the I think that anarchism and the anarchist schools of thought, by and large, can be uh, vanued at least in some way, right? I think I think those those folks who really do care about freedom and, and liberty, at least in some sense, uh, really ought to consider pursuing an invulnerability to coercion rather than either engage in endless uh, bickering and sometimes debate, but really just more bickering about nuance and minutia, like what the limited government people do, and instead get it very practical about what it would actually mean to live freely, uh, you know, in, uh, <laughs> in, in early 21st century North America. I mean, what would that actually look like? And I think that if they were to take invulnerability seriously, they would start to realize a couple things. One would be, they again, that DIY ethic being an important element of it, that they need to take personal responsibility for their own security. Remember, the state likes to trick people, and the neoconservatives in particular, they like to trick people into saying that, well, we must have national security, and it's time for you to give up your liberty in order to have security, right? And the truth of the matter is that, in fact, in order to have any real security, you need your liberty. It's just like survival. If you want to have good survivability, you need to be free. You need your liberty. 
And security works exactly the same way. In reality, to have good security, you need to be free. You need liberty, period. It is, it is a, I personally think it's a one-to-one -one correlation. So if you want good survivability, you want good security, you need your liberty. You need to not be constrained by the government's use of lawfare, the government's use of democide and other methods of tyranny that basically threaten to basically uh, put the population under more subjugation than they, than, than they already are. So uh, is, you know, is, is Vanu anarchic? Uh, not necessarily, I, I guess maybe in one sense, but then again, what does the word mean? I mean, without rulers, right? And so if we're pursuing invulnerability to coercion, to be perfectly frank with you, Shane, I don't see a ruler anywhere Yeah. Uh, as I'm pursuing invulnerability. So I guess maybe more by happenstance or accident, I guess it would be more arguably closer to being anarchic or what John Locke in Second Trade of Government called a state of nature. I would say that's accurate. That, yeah, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're pursuing, you are, even if you're doing Vanu in the cities and you have some sort of Vanu shelter like, um, uh, like an uh, anonymous apartment uh, under, rented under a pseudonym or you're living, uh, Rayo pointed this out too, like even some areas uh, of certain like enclaves of people in certain like inner city areas that interestingly enough actually have some degree of invulnerability although there's also a lot of private crime too to be perfectly frank um that that but but again those people have to be take security very seriously right because the state the police the blue coats are not going to defend those innocent uh residents there against gang bangers and private criminals they actually have to have guns for example to defend themselves from drive-by shootings and other similar types of things right so uh, there, there is, that's something to kind of consider is that uh, <laughs> life could be a little bit more complicated in some ways, but I honestly do think, man, that I think Vanuists and, and, and Vanuans are closer to being anarchic rather than not because there are no rulers that are going to make us invulnerable to coercion. And statists, unfortunately, do think, and some of the minarchists, unfortunately, to some degree, think that having rulers uh, makes them invulnerable. Yeah. And yeah. that, I think, is a very serious delusion uh, to, to take into consideration here. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think comparing, contrasting, you know, Vani with these various uh, anarchic schools of thought really, really does show you. I mean, uh, uh, there are, obviously there are a couple. I think syndicalism and uh, anarcho transhumanism really have no place. That really just aren't applicable to Vani, uh, really at all. Uh, but for 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 uh, for these other ones like uh, mutualism and uh, uh, voluntarism. Uh, I th I think it really takes it, it 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 takes the good from those into this again co like this cohesive uh, uh, like adaptable strategy to your lifestyle. So yeah, I really think this this uh, podcast uh, should really show you the potential that uh, that that Vanu has. Uh, but we haven't even really gotten to the action yet. So uh, if, if going through these these initial episodes and and you're and you're thinking, man, this this is sounding pretty good, sounding pretty good. Well, uh. Uh, yeah, you're in, you're in for a ride. <laughs> but uh, anything else, Kyle, before I close out the show? Yeah, I would just say this. Again, um, I wouldn't really kind of going, going forward into the future from this point onward, although at times it might be useful for people to compare and contrast the limited government position with the no government position, and I still do think it is the great debate of our time because it largely kind of incentivizes people uh, to pursue certain means rather than others. I would just say this, like Vanu itself is an ends and means and an insight. And I think part of that insight that Rayo was trying to uh, teach people was that whether we have you know, rulers, a few rulers, or limited rulers, which kind of doesn't make any sense, or, or, or no rulers, uh, the point is, let's let's be invulnerable to coercion, right? Because the private criminal element we will have with us always, simply because people have free will, and for whatever their reasons are, uh, they will choose to violate property rights. And so, even if we were living in Ancapistan, we would still need to have an invulnerability to coercion from private criminals and real felons and so forth. So, I think uh, I think Vanu is very practical for libertarians in that sense. And that is, uh, that is a good point uh, as well. If uh, Ian Capson comes around tomorrow, you'll still need Vanu. Uh, very good, yep. very good. Uh, well, thanks, Kyle, so much uh, for your time. I appreciate it. Yep, same here. Okay, so uh, thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. 
We certainly hope you enjoyed it and found it valuable. And again, we're getting closer and closer to the action, but we've got to lay this groundwork first uh, before uh, before we before we actually get into that. Next week, we'll cover a term Rayo used called legal interstices, or or otherwise known as uh, legal loopholes within the law that can be exploited. We'll discuss the benefits, potential ramifications, which Rayo went very deeply into, and much, much more. Make sure you go check out the website, vonnypodcast.com. And again, if uh, this is the first time you're hearing this term, uh, Vonny was spelled V as in victory, O, and as in Nancy U, vonnypodcast.com. Uh, go take a look at the definitions page, the frequently asked questions, and the articles about Vonnie tabs there at the top if you're looking for some homework to do uh, to keep you occupied until next week's release. Lastly, please consider leaving us a positive review on iTunes to help us get a good boost early on. We would certainly appreciate it. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>